Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glusic channel. I make videos about Dungeons & Dragons lore full time and have a collection of hundreds of monster ecology and strategy videos on my channel, including a complete A to Z list of all the monsters for the core monster manual. And this is a remake of one that I've previously done before, three years ago, so uh, it's in, well overdue for an update. If you like what I do, please consider subscribing as I upload at least twice a week. If you are new to Dungeons & Dragons, fair warning, there is a lot of deeply nerdy information in this video and it's quite lengthy. For those of you who catch my live streams on the weekend and have watched the videos on Spellweavers, Mind Flayers and the various videos on the Outer Plains, Gods, Planescape, Spelljammer and such, well, this one will make a lot more sense. Aboliths are justifiably one of the most feared monsters in Dungeons & Dragons by those who know what they are and what they can do. At first glance, they are not so scary. They are very large fish creatures, a bit like huge mutant catfish that tend to live very deep in the Underdark, and they have a very Lovecraftian vibe to them. They were created by David Zeb Cook for the first edition of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, showing up in the first uh, 1981 with, with the pages of the Dwellers of the Forbidden city where they were included in the second monster manual for that edition in 1983 a few years later in issue 131 of the dragon magazine published in 1988 we they got their own ecology video which expanded on their society and included new kinds of ablith and in Dun dungeon magazine number 12 that same year we saw the arrival of the saltwater ablith 10 years later they were well established in the game and were included in the complete psionics handbook in 1991 and in 1995 the savant ablith showed up in the night below and underdark campaign as well as the monstrous compendium annual number two skipping ahead to 3.5 edition the monster manual included the ablith mage there was a psionic ablith in the expanded psionics man manual in one of the best books published for that edition, Lords of Madness, the Book of Aberrations, also included the Amphibious, the Stygian, and the Aerial Abolith. Because 3.5 edition was all about a monster for every occasion, 4th edition had the Abolith Lasher, Slime Mage, Observer, and Servitor, different power levels for different uh, power levels in the game, and explored the movable citadel of Zippu, which are uh, within the pages of the Forgotten Realms campaign guide, and when the 5th edition arrived in 2014, the Abolith appears in both the core monster manual and the Princes of Apocalypse one year later. So, a long and rich legacy of lore for us to delve into. I would easily include the Abolith in my top 10 most iconic evil masterminds for the Dungeons & Dragons role-playing game. Let me tell you why. Aboliths are large aberrations who are not from the Far Realm, although in 4th edition they state that they are. There's more evidence to say that they're not. They are native to the elemental plane of water. When an Aboliths body is destroyed, their soul reappears back within the realm of the elemental plane and slowly grows a replacement body, constructing it via mental manipulation of ectoplasmic residue, which they reform into their own unique body tissues. They do not conform to the expected internal structure of an amphibian or fisher. Uh, fish. They quite often include unique body modifications to their form based on personal quirks and preferences, and these bodies are barely subject to the aging process. They are formed uh, fully grown when they replace their body and even a basic Aboleth body will remain fully functional for 2,000 years up to uh, almost indefinitely for the most advanced forms of Aboleth. They are also capable of uh, biological reproduction and they are organic creatures. An Aboleth feeds mainly on microscopic organisms and uh, small, small organisms which are bound in its natural habitat but it can consume larger prey if necessary and they have been known to swallow humans whole. Aboleth can survive in both air and water, but prefer water for obvious reasons. Every one of them has both male and female reproductive organs, though mating is rare and is restricted between Aboleth of the same class within their structured society. The basic form of the Aboleth is a large blue-green fish, which lacks all fins but the coidal, uh, coidal fin. It has a head with three large slit-like eyes and four long tentacles. Its mouth is like a great sucker that can be found um, under its body on the mottled pinkish-orange underside of the head section. On each of its sides can be found four tube-like orifices which excrete a vile slime which is mostly transparent but large amounts of it have a tone like an unhealthy mucus. This common abolith is about 20 feet or 6 meters long from head to tail and has 10 foot or 3 meter long tentacles. 
that is clumsy on land and usually cons- uh, encountered in underground lakes. That's the form of the ablith most often encountered by beings of the surface world, and it's also the weakest form of ablith. More on that in a minute. From the ablith's point of view, it is a superior life form, the apex. They may play around and experiment with other forms of life, but there is no need, uh, no great need to improve themselves. They are already perfect. They also uh, retain all of their memory, and much like mind flayers, they retain the memories of creatures they consume, although it's never comforting to be informed of that by an ablith that is currently eating you alive. Sure, your memories live on forever, but that's hardly the same as carrying on living. Abolith have the perspective of an immortal and alien creature of dizzying intelligence, with almost no empathy whatsoever for creatures that are not also immortal, which to them are simply insects, tools and playthings. Added to this is that they don't see any creatures who evolved after them as being entirely valid, because the actions of the gods, they are enemies of the gods and everything that the gods have done to the multiverse. Aboliths have the advantage of having seen, if not the, then certainly one of the original forms of the multiverse before the advent of the first gods and their manipulation of space and time, which recreated the multiverse over and over again. Of course, this makes the mind of any Abolith an extremely dangerous thing to make contact with, and since basically all Abolith have potent psychic abilities, they are exceedingly dangerous to be anywhere within range of their telepathic abilities. The oldest and most ex- Experienced members of their species are enormous, conscience-altered elder abliths who often exist in an almost purely mental form, though typically they are anchored to a, any particular reality with an incredibly ancient artifacts. Artifacts normally means magic items in Dungeons & Dragons terminology, but in the case of the abolith, this is not the case, as abolith typically do not use magic of any sort um, and don't make use of magic items. They either destroy them or lock them away in vaults as object, objects of curiosity worthy of further study. Abolith are psionic and just the worst kind of evil mad scientists you can imagine. I'll be talking more about their technological power in a few minutes. Aboliths have a similar understanding of the D&D multiverse that you or I do as, as players of the game, which means that they are one of the most intelligent races on whatever world they inhabit, and they are found on more worlds and more dimensions than most other species because they've been around for so long and developed the ability to explore transdimensionally so early compared to other transdimensional races, races who came along after them. Wherever you go, chances are they have already been. Abolith recall different multiverses and the various changes caused by the actions of time-traveling species such as the Elithids, the powers who alter reality on a fairly regular basis such as the greater gods and primordial beings, and also the activities of species who have lost their original reality and now find themselves at odds with the current state of the multiverse. Some, like the Lachey, merely adapt to the new situation and carry on in the shadows, their legacy a private memory they rarely share. Others, like the Spellweavers and the Quam, actively work at odds with the current reality and will stuff but nothing, nothing as to, as they see it, restore the universe to their view of the natural order of things. But the Abolith are intelligent enough to know that there is no reset switch. There is an infinite, uh, instead an infinite variety, an array of different parallel dimensions and their many versions of inner and outer planes of existence that they can adapt to, explore and dominate. Those places that would prove too dangerous for them to completely control, they simply establish a secure and secluded series of locations in which to concentrate their power sufficiently to repel any potential threats with overwhelming force while they study and gather knowledge as best as they can. So let's take a little tour. In this case, it is so deep down in the lower underdark that even the drow would consider it to be quite far down. The ancient frontier, the land of massive caverns and huge ocean-sized freshwater lakes, which have been largely undisturbed for hundreds of thousands of years. Down this far, it is a steaming tropical environment. The air is almost toxic with volcanic fumes, dank humidity. This is close to the ancient lakes. The air smells like the abolith themselves smell, which is a lot like rancid grease. Having encountered an abolith once before, a specimen kept in the very secure vaults of Candlekeep, you know that they are large aquatic creatures that weigh in excess of 6,500 pounds at least. There may have been some degradation of that sample. Approaching the shore of the lake, which froths with a slick and fizzing foam of decaying clumps of pink and red algae, webbed with strands of fungus mycelia, itself crawling with insects and grubs, all pale and bloated, some faintly glowing. 
Stooped over, wading around the shoreline, mostly naked and appearing weirdly wet and shiny, a group of twelve humanoids of various kinds reach into the slop and grab at loathsome wriggling things that they pluck from the goop and place into holding pods of some glass-like material. They are being bitten by these creatures and seem... Something seems very wrong with their skin, as if it's been turned to some sort of semi-transparent jelly. Kept constantly wet by this organic-looking thing climbing up their back with a pulsating tube dangling down into the murky water. Pours along the web of tubes, dug into their flesh and their shoulders and chest, keep a steady trickle of lake water running over their bodies, and they repeatedly belch up water that pours like slime out of their mouths, overflowing from lungs poorly suited to breathing water. They are clearly in pain, exhausted, but from the vacant gaze of their milky white eyes, there is no pain, only the twisted expression of constant horror from the powerful and alien mind that is dominating their every thought. Rising up behind them, some distance from the shore and keeping its three black and glistening eyes fixed on them, is the massive bulk of a much larger abolith. This one is at least 30 feet long and has two attending slaves which appear to have once been much larger humanoids, though the species is unrecognisable. So perhaps these ones were purpose-bred? They are clad in the same glass-like material with strange patterns of gleaming material inside it. They have looked at what looks like short spears with oddly thick shafts and a blade pointed with some sort of a blunt crystal instead of a sharp tip. And there is a fleshy cord that runs from the spear to the bulging compartment back, built in the back of their uh, armor's breastplate right over the shoulders. The two guards twitch and turn in your direction, somehow detecting your presence, even though you are enchanted with an invisibility spell. They raise their spears, pointing them in your direction, and suddenly the air is split, and the whole area lights up as beams of radiant energy fire out at them, at you. The searing heat instantly blistering your flesh as you dive for cover behind an ancient and fungus-covered stalagmite crawling with weird and unfamiliar insects and crustaceans of this alien environment. This is as close as you could hope to get without guaranteeing that you will be captured and enslaved by the Ablith, as they are the absolute masters of this, their domain. Far beyond the shore, deep below the dark lake surface, suspended and dimly glowing with lurid green and dim blue lights, a great sphere of thick and very strong glass-like material houses an enormous structure of twisting spires, spirals like seashells, fluid-filled hollows, chutes, canals, pillars of grotesque artistry, all the such surfaces slick and made of some sort of organic-looking pearl material, often with the same sort of twisting, convoluted, but clearly artificial devices built into the arches, set in alcoves within the slime pools, forming delicate membranes and projecting shelves where tanks, containers, and cells hold all manner of twisted horrors. This is a city of the Abolith, where the other member castes of their race can be exclusively found. These much larger individuals make up the class called Nobles, who are ten feet larger than the greater Abolith who are in charge of slave maintenance. The Nobles have swollen cranial areas, and the two front up topmost tentacles end in delicate fingers, which are better suited to their role as dedicated scientific researchers and conductors of endless mad experiments. Each of them is housed in their own residence and laboratory within the sphere. And further inside, there is a larger and less cluttered residence of the ruler, one more physically even larger than the nobles. This 40-foot-long creature doesn't need to move around much and is uh, not attended by any slaves, rather it has subservient abolith offspring that serve its every need. Around the city, the younger abolith typically live in close proximity to the same class of society that birthed it, slowly growing over many decades. Abolith only breed rarely, and by rarely I mean once every 500 years, and in the case of rulers, they have to travel to another city to do so. They each lay an egg one week later in a secluded and tightly guarded part of the residence. The eggs take at least five years to gestate, growing from the size of a human head to slightly under six feet wide, surrounded by protective nutrients slime a few feet thick. When it hatches, the juvenile goes through a year-long process with many different stages of transformation until it resembles a miniature adult. It then grows to adult size over the next ten years, at all times closely guarded by other abolith. The ruler only mates once in its life, and this growth process takes at least a hundred years. As is mentioned, a few abolith may also reappear in the city, having formed, reformed a new body in the elemental plane of water after the old one got destroyed. 
The Apple depicted as a challenge rating 10 creature of lawful evil alignment in the Monster Manual is actually the weakest of their kind. That is the slave gatherer caste of their society, sent out to fulfill their quota of new slave collection, which are then collected by the Greater Ableth when seven or more slaves are collected who supervises them along with five other slave gatherers. Each city has up to 12 Greater Ableth in charge of their five gatherers and all of the slaves, and there is also at least six of the Noble Ableth and just one of the ruler Ableth. There is also a grand Ableth, a massive creature of immense power that dwarfs even a greater Ableth, and these will only be there will only be one grand Ableth for each world or plane of existence with an established Ableth population. The region around the entire lake will have slimy wet surfaces making it difficult to rain, and water sources within a mile of an Ableth lair will be supernaturally fouled, causing anyone who drinks the water to start being violently sick vomiting within minutes. The collective psychic emanations of all these Ableth cause a special ability of any Ableth to cast an illusionary image of itself, like a holographic copy that is not solid, but can still be project the uh, telepathy of the Ableth who created it. This trait also applies to a temporary layer of any Ableth that is far from its home sphere deep in the Underdark. And just a side note, Wizards of the Coast. When you are emulating the psychic powers of a psionic creature that shuns using magic, try to avoid using the word magic, as it's needlessly confusing. So forgive me if I correct all the instances in your descriptions of this creature's powers, technologies, and abilities. I'm just trying to make it clearer for everybody. When fighting inside its lair, an Ableth can invoke the ambient psionic field to take lair actions, and on initiative count 20, losing initiative ties, the Ableth takes a lair action to cause one of the following effects. The Ableth casts Phantasmal Force. No components required as this is a psychic power for the Ableth. On any number of creatures it can see within 60 feet of it. While maintaining concentration on this effect, the Ableth can't take other lair actions, which are typically psychic actions. If a target succeeds on the saving throw, or if the effect ends for it, the target is immune to the Ableth's Phantasmal Force uh, lair action for the next 24 hours although such a creature can choose to be affected. Personally, I do not include this limitation on any Ableth psionic abilities. I think this should absolutely be an ability that has a recharge mechanic instead, requiring a roll of 5 or 6 on a d6 rolled after the Phantasmal Force power is used, because traditionally they can use Phantasmal Force every round. Pools of water within 90 feet of the Ableth surge upward in a grasping tide. Each Cre- uh, any creature on the ground within 20 feet of such a pool must succeed on a DC 14 strength saving throw or be pulled up to 20 feet into the water and knocked prone. The Ableth can't use this lair action again until it has used a different one. And this is essentially them using water as a technology, similar to the movie The Abyss, where the creatures could somehow manipulate water. Well, the Ableths do this using a combination of uh, technology and psychic telepathy and telekinesis. So they can form machinery and tools and things basically out of water using hydro, hydro static and hydro um, hydraulic effects. Water in the Ableth's lair magically becomes a conduit for the creature's rage. The Ableth can target any number of creatures it can see in such water within 90 feet of it, and the target must succeed on a DC 14 wisdom saving throw or take 2d6 psychic damage. The Ableth can't use this lair action again until it's used a different one. So there you go, they are actually projecting their psyche through water. The Ableth can engage in physical combat, though it prefers to send its minions in first to test a target's abilities and to keep them at bay while unleashing a torrent of psychic attacks. The Ableth Gatherer, depicted on the stat block, is a slave acquisition specialist, so its limited psychic power is totally devoted to its ability to enslave a target. Three times per day, the Ableth targets one creature it can see within 30 feet of it. The target must succeed on a DC 14 wisdom saving throw or be magically charmed by the Ableth until the Ableth dies or until it is on a different plane of existence from the target. The charm target is under the Ableth's control and can't take reactions, and the Ableth and the target can communicate telepathically with each other over any distance. (laughs) A horrifying prospect. Whenever the charm target takes damage, the target can repeat the saving throw, On a success, the effect ends, no more than once every 24 hours. The target can also repeat the saving throw when it's at least one mile away from the Ableth. Also, as one of the Ableth's legendary actions options, it can spend two of these actions to physically drain one creature charmed by it, inflicting 3d6 psychic damage and healing itself for the same amount. 
Another cast of Ableth have much more potent psychic powers. They include free use of the Phantasmal Force power, and I suggest using the Sorcerer class to determine spell slots and such. I will include a link to a series of articles by Nate from Nerdarchy on what spells from 5th edition work perfectly fine as psychic powers. Credit where credit is due. Excellent work, Nate. And remember, uh, remember, psionics work the same as spells of the same name for the most part, require no components, and use the Aboleth's intelligence to determine the spell save DC. Oh, and you may they may be boosted by psychic crystals and other alien te- technologies manufactured by the Aboleth. More on that in a minute. I'll put a link to the Nerdarchy article down below. Physically, even a gatherer Aboleth is a powerful creature. It's got an armor class of 17, natural armor, 18d10 plus 36 or between 54 and 216 with an average of 135 hit points. Deceptively fast swim speed of 40 feet per round but a sluggish speed of 10 feet per round on land and the creature has a dexterity of 9 so they're cumbersome. Strength a tremendous 21 so feel free to have the Aboleth use grapple and constrict with its tentacle attacks. Why not? It makes 3 tentacle attacks per round all plus 9 to hit a target up to 10 feet away, so they've got reach, and inflict 2d6 plus 5 bludgeoning damage. Against a living creature, its touch has uh, an extra dangerous element. The target must succeed on a DC 14 constitution saving throw or become diseased. The disease has no effect for one minute and can be removed by any magic that cures disease. After that one minute, the diseased creature's skin becomes translucent and slimy. The creature can't regain hit points unless it is underwater, and the disease can only be removed uh, by it can be removed only by a heal or another disease curing spell of sixth level or higher. When the creature is outside a body of water, it takes 1d12 acid damage every 10 minutes unless moisture is applied to the skin before the 10 minutes has passed. The Aboleth's uh, tail strike is the same except it inflicts 3d6 plus 5 bludgeoning damage and will not subject the creature to the skin disease. Only the tentacles will. Two other traits are the mucus cloud and the Aboleth's telepathy. While underwater, the Aboleth is surrounded by a transformative mucus. A creature that touches the Aboleth or that hits it with a melee attack while within 5 feet of it uh, must make a DC 14 constitution saving throw as they're splashed or contacted by this stuff. On a failure, the creature is diseased for 1d4 hours. The diseased creature can only breathe underwater. Uh, so they, they can't breathe above water, only below water. If a creature communicates telepathically with the Aboleth, the Aboleth learns the creature's greatest desires if the Aboleth can see the creature. So they, they delve into your mind even as you're contacting them. Constitution is 15, which is pretty robust, but the mental attributes of the Aboleth are very impressive. An intelligence and charisma of 18 and a wisdom of 15. That's just on a basic Aboleth. So a very logical, cold and calculating intelligence, and it only gets more intelligent from there with the different casts. When not pitting them uh, slaves against each other in senseless gladiatorial games of abject cruelty just for their amusement, the Aboleth busy themselves with two main pastimes, which are scientific invention, and a long period of time where they slip into a waking dream of reverie, spending time delving deeply into their distant memories, often memory which has been passed down to them from their parent. This form of racial memory is incredibly important to the Aboleth mentality and the function of their society, which exists in a way that is totally weird to creatures that do not persist in both spirit form and as shared experiences across family lineages. It is typical that a young Aboleth is not... uh, untrained or unfamiliar with any particular task it merely has this feeling that it's very rusty and it just needs a matter of practice to restore their ability to full mastery so to an observer the intelligence of the abolith just seems phenomenal as you can hand a complex task to a juvenile abolith and within a very short time they will be masters of that task as though they've been doing it for centuries which in effect they have Now, of particular interest to me is the subject of Aboleth technology and their shunning of magic, which is a trait that they seem to share with Elithids, but for entirely different reasons. Aboleth are master psychic powerhouses. They're also inventors and manufacturers of technology that boosts their psychic strength and also emulates magic items. It's actually more a matter of fluff than crunch, which is D&D jargon for story or descriptive text rather than game mechanics or rules text. A magic uh, wand that shoots magic missiles has 
and has a set number of charges exactly like a high technology energy weapon. There is also a range of high tech weapons listed in the Dungeons Master's Guide ready made for you. One particular line of text in the lore from an old Dragon Magazine ecology article really set my mind ablaze though and it was this, I'll paraphrase. Noble Ablith use their ability to probability travel, which is the psychic power to, tr- to physically travel to the astral flame, to plane and from there travel to other planes and planets. They can also take along other beings that are in physical contact with them, uh, as well as many strange drugs and devices to, tra- to travel to alternate prime material planes. There they amass as much knowledge as possible while enslaving any who oppose them, every so often mounting a full raid of several nobles and their attending lesser slaver castes, both the common and greater Ablith, into particularly promising worlds, but it is a rare occurrence. Oh, the plot hooks contained in that. Strange drugs that can cause uh, what seems like intense hallucinations, but are actually visions of alternate dimensions occupying the same physical space. So you're staring into the Feywild. Drugs that drastically amplify thoughts, causing unintentional telepathic broadcasts by non psychic creatures and have a good chance of driving them temporarily insane. Drugs that are essentially liquefied instructional knowledge of complex interplanar mechanics, causing the poor player character to go racing around screaming their understanding of the multiverse and desperately scribbling down it a babbling nonsense of strange symbols that they will cease to understand the moment the effect wears off. This is a perfect opportunity to introduce an actual Stargate into your D&D multiverse, with the Aboleth essentially being the ancients who created automated sentient spell jamming vessels that seeded the spheres with the Stargate rings, and the Elithids are basically the Gua'ul system lords. I mean, what if the Elithids could delay the full conversion of a host into a mind flayer and instead operate as the mind-controlling brain parasites indefinitely. I bet that got your mental gears spinning. The Abolith could have a device similar to one of the masters of the universe movie, where Gwildor, the Thanorian uh, locksmith, invented a cosmic key that could open a portal to anywhere by utilising sound keys. The possibilities are fairly endless, really. Portraying just how intelligent the Abolith are is as easy as this. They know what you know, the Dungeon Master and Watcher of all, the, of all these lore videos about the D&D multiverse, what you know. The average character in your D&D game doesn't know any of this stuff. You can count on two hands how many living Archmages know all this stuff. The most powerful Celestials and Gods, Primordials, they know this stuff. But it's really an over God level of information that we as players of the game are privy to. It is an extra dimensional understanding beyond the veil of the fourth wall. Aboleth are so damn smart they can travel to very similar alternate realities where the creation of the universe occurred earlier or later, but has otherwise remained extremely similar. So they get to time travel without any chance of messing up their own reality, without any paradox, and just move back to their own reality to take actions that have the highest probability of turning out exactly as they predicted. It's like they can flip through the pages of a choose-your-own-adventure book, or establish save points in a network of variant realities mind-bending stuff and even more amazing that you understood exactly what i'm talking about well done i think you're ready to do these horrible creatures justice don't forget they love to conduct cruel and outlandish experiments they build technological wonders that mimic the powers of magical items and artifacts they travel the planes of existence and move between the different world settings for dungeons and dragons they share memories and effectively reincarnate when they're destroyed and the abolith listed in the monster manual is actually the weakest version of their kind They also know things about the former states of the universe before the gods went around scrapping each other and powerful primordials all over space and time, recklessly disrupting things so badly that whole civilizations, species and worlds were just retconned and stranded in suddenly different realities that no longer resembled what those beings remembered. This uh, And this not only did happen many times, it's still happening, because the warfare is taking a place across time as well as space. So yeah, the Abolith really detest the gods and they shun magic, because a lot of it is a byproduct of that temporal and spatial disruption, with effects in the astral and ethereal planes creating flows of energy and destabilized reality that do not and should not exist. The irony is... They have a much better understanding of the true mysteries of magic, but will never instruct any others what those secrets are, because they would rather magic not exist at all. So it's highly likely that noble Aboleth make use of anti-magic devices with effects similar to those of the central eye of a beholder. Easily one of the most gnarly monsters in the game, 
no question. And even with half an hour of explaining it to you, I feel like I've just scratched the surface. Please hit the like button if you've made it this far. Subscribe if you like what I do. Check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts of these videos. Buy some merchandise. We're your geek with pride. And as always, thanks for listening. And I'll be back with more for you very soon.